Situational accessibility, so situation impairment, so that's good. So what does that actually mean though? Who knows what that means? Situation. <coughs> yes? It's like the thing you said about the people on their bikes are running on the bars bikes. Like yeah. They want to check where there's a free spot for the bike in, but they can't find the bike on the bars bike. Yeah, so it's the bars bike thing, so people are constrained by their either their device or their environment in which they're using their device for context of use. So those things are called situational impairments. Um, so that's a good reason why it's very important as well. And the others? Yeah? A very noisy environment. For example, doing yeah. uh, you know, a speech based on a machine. You've got some way of tracking the machine despite the noise. Yeah, so if you've got uh, noisy environments, for instance, then obviously the auditory cues aren't going to work very well for you. So you need things which are uh, more visual. So it's a loss, it's a loss, uh, it's a low level loss of a combination of different kinds of um, sensory input, so a loss of hearing, loss of vision, but maybe not as extreme, but altogether, because they make small losses, altogether they make up um, a larger kind of impairment. Um, so what, what should we do on combinatorial impairment? Is it, is it, should it really be called seniors or older people, or should it be called combinatorial impairment? Obviously, there might be if you've read anything or heard me back talk about it. But uh, what about your view? For your 20%, 25% of the general thoughts, Mark? Yes? So generally you can just say, oh, this is 
that all the reports are still stigmatising, so people are just sort of saying, you know, it's just something I want to do to people. Um, and also, that's the other thing, um, that it's actually a greater than exists for everybody, it's just that it might be seen more in older people, but that doesn't mean anything. That's like saying blindness is that older people, because older people get more macular degeneration. Uh, so, you know, that's as that's that's wrong as anything else. Okay. Um, so first of all, I'm not going to ask you to describe an interface bridge, but what the hell am I talking about when I say an interface bridge? What's an interface bridge? Um, what I'm talking about in this context. So we talked about some frameworks last week, like NSAA and uh, iAccessible and iAccessible 2. Nobody knows what an interface bridge is, or that's fine. And they walked in. So generally the bridge, the interface bridge is the bridge that joins the, the actual GUI technology, the widgets, the GUI technology, the GUI framework you are using. In the case of Java, it's the Java virtual machine that you can do it to sit on top of that. Uh, the framework, the GUI framework that sits on top of that, joins it to the accessible, to the accessibility machine. principles that everybody else understands that accessible design to be. How do we remember that? Four. Okay, so what do we think P stands for? Perceivable. What about O? Huh? Operable. What about U? Understandable.
So that's why I think actually usability it has a connotation of quantity, of generalizability. And that might not be right okay, in the modern UX world, I don't think. We were talking, so of, um, of um, Epidaurus 2009 paper, what do we think about Epidaurus 2009 paper with regard to some of the aspects that might be associated with usability? For instance, UX is temporal. So therefore, it might be usable, but that might be a function of the time, or the biorhythms of the persons, or the people who are doing it. It might be a function of when we were actually um, out there doing work. Um, those people, just because I know now, that you guys who are doing the teacher stuff, uh, uh, so you must realise that things are different based on what time you go and see, see people, so things are different based on, but the questions, the answers you get to questions after you will be different based on, based on when you talk to people or how happy they are or what day it is, etc. Would that be right? Yeah? So therefore, if you're doing those kind of if you were doing these dirty tests, that would also be the case. You'd get different outcomes. And so therefore, it's less generalizable. Although, usability seems generalizable. Okay, so efficiency is for everybody. So who knows? I mean, you all must have heard of NEST. When this was up, when I put this up three years ago, nobody had ever heard of NEST. But have you guys heard of NEST? Yeah? I mean, because you can go to bottom, yeah, or Google them, so they want to make it to all the data from the houses. So we've got Nest, and Nest also, this is a Nest thermostat, and it's a smart thermostat, it learns based on um, the biorhythms of the house, okay, so it's got a smart learning mechanism based on the biorhythms, if you like, of the house. So generally, um, it starts off with some very coarse grained um, setup, and then all you do is twizzle, it's, it's work this based on the touch screen and also by rotating the um, bezel on here so that you can actually turn up the temperature, turn down the temperature, it remembers when you're doing that and so therefore it makes a prediction about what you're going to want before you get there. Okay? So it's a nice little smart thermostat. There's a new, uh, they have a, next have a new product which is a um, uh, smoke detector. Um, most smoke detectors work as a, as a, as a cluster, as a hive if you like. So therefore, the more smoke detectors you have, the more, um, the, the better it's able to predict whether there really is a fire, whether there really is smoke, uh, whether it's something to be worried about, if it's in the kitchen or not, that kind of thing. Okay, on the other side, we have a modern, standard modern thermostat. Of course, there's a difference in price. So the price point for this is something like 100 pounds for one of these, and the price point for this modern thermostat might be as cheap as 20. That's one of the differences. But these save you a lot of money because they're, like, they're located in particular rooms. These don't have to be hard because they're located in individual rooms. However, just from a UX point of view, which, which would you choose to have in your house if you could? Which, which do you think would be better for you? It's kind of an honest choice in my opinion. Would anybody choose? Because I'd like to hear their alternate opinion. Would anybody choose the modern food staff? No, it looks a bit like Linux, kind of. It's a bit Linux. Come on, mind. yeah. Maybe not because it's beautiful, but because you know, I was just thinking that one of the first times in my life when um, a technology could exist and it's come in, and um, I don't feel like I'm wanted. I'm okay. more controlled, and I don't necessarily use the technology to do it. So I'm more controlled than that. Trust the technology, okay? Fair enough. I mean, you can sort of obviously switch this to more control, but yeah, that's fine. Um, I mean, you know, it's also, this one here tells you that it's going to be 72 degrees in 25 minutes, for instance, so you get some prediction later on, but that's a good point. Maybe that we want more control, maybe we've, we've stepped over the edge and we want more control, not less uh, control, yes? I guess you might go for the right one if you don't like touch screens. Yeah, you might go for the right one if you don't like touch screens. I mean, obviously, the touch screens can be really difficult if you're blind, um, but you probably don't have to touch it less because it predicts what you're going to want. Um, I'm not quite sure whether this modern thermostat here is any better if you if you're visually disabled because you know you've got there's nothing there's no audio built in you've just got some but you've got some touch sensitive buttons. Okay. Anybody else would like the modern thermostat as opposed to the nest? You would like. Depends on the network, but the choice of oil on the technology. 
Yeah, so generally, if it's not as good as it purports to be, if it really does get the predictions wrong, if it's not getting it right for you, then yeah, that could be part of the plan, absolutely. So I presume if you're in a household which is quite, um, uh, which is not very systematic, where there's lots of competing demands from lots of different people, all at the same time, all in the same spot, then that could be part of the plan. Pardon? Yeah, that's So this um, nice efficient, so, so it can tell you what it's going to do. So you see that we've got this nice um, line here, and you can see that Friday, there's a visit to the time, which is about 6 p.m., then there's going to be a change. It's going to try and raise the temperature between 78 degrees Fahrenheit, which of course is all Fahrenheit, it's very, very, very hot, uh, 78 degrees. Um, now if you can move that, um, you can change it to the temperature, you can remove it, or you can set it. So, you know, it's actually quite a nice display, it's quite inch. The thing, the thing to, I think, to think about is, that even if you didn't predict it, even if you did no prediction, it's just up to you to decide how you can set things manually, the interface to me seems a lot more, a lot nicer, it's a lot more familiar. Um, it's kind of clearer what I'm going to do and why I'm going to do it. Here, there seems to be a speckle of numbers. So I, I need to know what the numbers are to make, to make any kind of uh, assumption about how you use it. Whereas here, it seems to be reasonably straightforward that these numbers are three Friday, three times, uh, this, is, this is what the temperature is going to be, and I can change the numbers. So, I mean, some people like the modern thermostat. Most, most people that I come across like the Nest thermostat, but the price is the same. consensus on meaning, but there's no real consensus. So that's something you need to consider. When people talk to you about this kind of topic, you need to clarify with them what exactly it is they mean. Okay? So has anybody heard of the religious term agnosticism? Is anybody an agnostic? Not agnostic, agnostic. That any discussion on anything is pointless unless you can any discussion on this kind of server is really just pointless unless you can accurately define the entity you're trying to talk about and also that that definition contains the ability of reputation. Okay. So you can use it. And you know that's something that um, you need to take into account, if you like, in this context, because lots of people have lots of different understandings about what usability is, what the consensus, there is no consensus on usability. Um, there's some broad consensus. Older uh, researchers might think of it very much more as HCI quality. Newer researchers, younger researchers, poor people who are into, um, uh, into the UX, uh, they might have got bang and smash each other two viewpoints, might think of it differently. So, depending on what kind of job you're doing, you might have a manager who thinks, or a client who thinks it's more about task completion time. You might have another client who thinks it's more about um, happiness of their workforce, <coughs> because their workforce, happy, the happy workforce will be more productive. Okay? So you've got to think about what it is they need to do with the So some people think of usability as a software specialism of the larger topic of ergonomics. So who's heard of ergonomics? Okay, so we all associate ergonomics, and most of us, with um, kind of physical, physical ergonomics. So sitting in a tree, sitting in a chair, uh, we want to design the chair in an ergonomic way so it fits our body. But you can also have more organizational ergonomics, you can have cognitive ergonomics. So these are the things where we similar to cognitive, so we 
We're trying to fit our tools to the ergonomics of cognition of a situation, of an organisation, or mostly people think about it in terms of um, an attitude and an ergonomic chair. Okay. Other big topics are tangential. We look at the ergonomics focusing on the physiological matters, visibility, uh, focusing on physiological matters. Experts have written separate but overlapping frameworks for aspects of usability. We should be taking into account and designing the building interfaces, so this is quite important. There's lots of different ideas about what is usable and what usability is about. Five years ago, six, well, even ten years ago, there was this idea that, um, on, that we want to see everything we can on one page, if you like, or on one interface uh, window, so that we have less clicks. You can have everything, all the options displayed in one point, it's less clicks. So we measure, if we measure how usable something is based on how few clicks it takes to get to an endpoint, then that seems logical. Because if you have everything on one page, you only have to take one click to get to anything. However, it might take you a hell of a long time to find the functionality you want to click, to find the, the interface component you want to click. After that point, the last seconds being gospel, the fewer clicks the better. After that point, we've got this idea of progressive disclosure, whereby we're looking to have, we're not bothered about measuring clicks anymore, we measured, we're bothered about measuring speed, how fast can we actually fight, complete a task. It doesn't matter about how many clicks it takes. However, ergonomists, physical ergonomists, think that maybe it does because you have more repetitive strain injury, more clicks, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it's not a clear and concise uh, consensus. Okay? <coughs> the meanings aren't clear, they aren't concise. And what you think, what holds as being truth now, isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily hold as being truth in five years' time. And so what I want you to get from this is that there's a number of different competing views. We're going to see those different competing views and terms put together in a tabular format. But the thing to think about is, for all of your work, the way to future prove yourself against this is to make sure that you come back to the most basic scientific method, that you test, that you define your terms accurately, that you make your terms, make the terms in which you're talking about refutable, that you question everything. I got an email about, um, about um, criti critical analysis and critique. In fact, I've updated the notes, so it's a bit more explicit, actually, the handout. Um, so people seem to think that critique is only about negative, critical thoughts about something. Okay? But a critique isn't. A critique can be very positive. It can have positive, it can be positive, and positive, and have positive effects. The critique, critique just means it's a systematic way based on rational ways of thinking. A systematic, rational way of, of Understanding complex arguments, okay, maybe in presenting, but, and then representing those complex arguments. It doesn't have to be negative, it doesn't have to be positive. I mean, you know, it's not one of everything. And that's what you should be used to, get used to doing. And everything that you're given, when somebody says, oh, this system is better because uh, it's, you know, it's, you've done usability tests and this system is better. How have they done those usability tests? Why did they do those usability tests? What's formed their opinion? Anybody heard the term reductionist? No? So lots of people in say social science might think that psychologists, not psychologists, social uh, might think that say particle physicists are reductionist because particle physicists want to describe the world and the universe in terms of particles and how they interrelate. And that's the smallest thing. Yet actually, sociologists want to describe the world in terms of how everything relates and the interconnections between it, and that's more that's not the okay. So, you might want to think about the mindset that people have. The scientists who pick the problems, the, the usability experts who decide what kind of usability you're going to be doing, where are they for coming from? Where are these people mostly coming from? What's their background? They're white males from a middle class background. Mostly. That's changing now. That's the way that's the way it often is. 
And so therefore, they've got a specific thing that they're interested in, a set of things that they're interested in. They've got a set of tasks. They've got a set of beliefs. So science in that concept, in that way, isn't so dispassionate. Usability and the tests you're going to do isn't so dispassionate. Do you have to think about everything? Question everything. Okay. Universal design and design for all. So, there's a concept of usability which is about including users in the testing process. It's very much related. It looks, it feels a bit like agile design methods. So, think of agile design and agile development when you've got um, when you've got these iterative cycles and you've got users involved in quite a lot of these iterative cycles. Sometimes even on the project team, okay, you've got users involved in the work. Then you've also got to think to yourself, um, why was this created? Why was this sort of universal design, universal for all design, why was this created? And the reason why universal design was created is because people saw that we had this well, what kind of software did we used to build? What kind of design did we used to use? A lot of software we used. What did we do this? I mentioned it before. Yeah. Waterfall. Huh? Waterfall. Waterfall. No, it's not the methodology, but the kind of design, pro the, the sort of thoughts that they have. Maybe it's a bit different to say, but they used to use the called autobiographical design, whereby you're designing just for you, or just for the people you are and you know. Okay? And that means that things weren't universal. So, Universal suggests that most UX design ideas, that the solutions they come up with must best fit most of the population most of the time. Okay. So, even in usability, you need to think how can, this, how can this fit most of the population most of the time? Um, so, it may very well be that we don't all agree with this. Certainly, Universal Design, I think, is a useful tool. I think you need to come to your own decision about it. Universal design is a useful tool and it's a useful concept to have in your mind. But when you make a tool that's, that's um, or a design that's useful for most of the people, must best fit most of the population, then that means you can exclude people who aren't in the most. It's not what the intention was, but it's definitely what the definition says. And so we're coming back with adaptive systems with technology and adaptive programming, adaptive systems, adaptive software engineering to be able to try and put some adaptability into those and flexibility into the designs. So I think that's something that you need to think about that's important in usability. This idea of building in flexibility. So my unconventional view, and you can see this in the... Uh, well, there's a reference there. Um, by trying to address all your needs in one design, the technology is, is apt to address none. There's also a very nice little quote from a guy called uh, Alan Dix. Have anybody heard of Alan Dix? No? Okay. So, Alan Dix, uh, in, in your notes, there's a quote by him and, uh, in some of the work that he was uh, doing. If, if in the universal design realm, there'd only be one chapter. social choices, people would use Google because they, or used to use Google because it was a cool company and they liked to use Google. Lots of other reasons. Making software usable is not just about the utilitarian view of the software use, it's also about personal choice of the user. And that personal choice can, could come from your, you know, cognitive purposes, so your psychology, it could come from your physical 
physiology, it can come from sociology, it can come from, come from what you think is, is good in your big group. Great flexibility and keep configurability of both interfaces and interactions are the solution. Okay, so that's what I would technology to allow flexibility. But other people have different views. So you need to come to your view and explain it to them in the original four questions which we want to. Okay. So there's a few models that I want to quickly whip through here. And I want you to understand these particular models. We tr we've tried from the earliest parts of computers like this time to understand this condition, to understand how we do things. Um, to measure those things, so we've got fits law where we're looking at measurement stuff. And we also have a thing called the human processing model, which is called the model of the neural. And this was an attempt to, to, to come out with some kind of processing metric for cognitive load. How long will things take people to process? And how long would it take people to react to stuff on the interface, to the interface level? How could we do that prediction? So we have this one. How long would it take you take to perform a certain task? Yeah? X amount of times to calculate cognitive and motor processing time. Allows the system design to predict performance. That was one of the things. So therefore, you don't need to do user trials. You can predict performance based on these models. That's one of the things. Um, each processor has a cycle time. And each memory has a decay time. So you've got a, you've got a processor which is the actuator of something, and then you've got a, a memory, a model of memory which has a decay time. So the time is going to forget, you forget fragments. Okay. Now, this was done a long time ago, and it's not very accurate, unfortunately. Not very accurate at all. There's too many variables, and there's too many things called, which you're going to know more of, confounding variables. Who knows what confounding variables? not in medicine, clinical, clinical work. So a confounding variable is a variable in an experiment which is which might be um, an explanation for an outcome that you're having which you're associating with some other variable. So for instance, um, we might people people on people here might suggest that um, uh, Google, you know, say Google um, is it's faster to do a Google query because it's got clear green interface. But a confounding variable for that may be the fact that, well, actually, um, it's not about the interface at all. It's not even about the user. It's about the fact that they've got more machinery in the background that can process the query for you. Or that most people, or that people who use Google are um, high achievers and therefore have and, and in big companies and have fast internet connections. Or it might be that. Um, well, for instance, in the FE Law work of 2009, we talked about what were possible confounding variables for their data, which were the fact that they only had four, possibly four or five um, countries. So it was only the, it wasn't a worldwide view; it was a country view. Okay, so those those are confounding variables to what their what the outcome is. So now we have this other thing, which we created, which was also a problem to try and get around some of this. So this is called GOES, Goals, Operators, Methods, and Selection Rules. Okay? So GOES is a, I mean, you can find lots of work on, uh, on uh, human process models and, and, and GOES. GOES is quite a well-known, well-developed tool. But again, users, it expects users to follow logical routines. It is not resilient to user unpredictability. What do we know about users? What do we know about in this context? What do we know about users? All users. That they're unpredictable. Okay, so all users are unpredictable. That's absolutely right. Okay, so in the UX view of this, it's very difficult to get to say that users follow logical routines. Sometimes they do, that changes over time and what with what they're feeling like. And it's not generalizable. So then, we go 
to a, I think it's a more constrained version called the KLM model, which is the keystroke level model. So here we're not here we're all about connecting keystroke level stuff. So we're not even bothering anymore about pointing devices over really this stuff because it's all not predictable. Now we're down to a keystroke level. And now we kind of get some, it's very reductionist. <coughs> so when I say about reduction, when I talk about reductionist, the human processor model was least reductionist. Now this is this is the most reductionist because we think we can model people by the keystrokes. Okay, so it's a reductionist way of doing so. Anyway, it's simplistic, it's amenable to computation, and you can download a tool. So has anybody heard of COM tool or anybody used COM tool? So you can get timelines of how this might look. So you can output all these timelines. And therefore you can compare one, it's very quantitative, you can compare one interface and path to the task with another interface and path to the task to see which the KLM model decides is going to be the most efficient model. Okay. Are you, does that make sense or do you want to go through it together or are you confused? Silence equals acceptance.
formulate something that's doing. And we come on to this other, to the second um, uh, page in the table, it's all the notes of course, uh, so we can see that we've got visibility, and utility, and the use of And you can see that some of these are obviously coming from the star interface. And so it's going to be because we see what's going to be the is still controlling, not controlling, but still important for the way we look at periods today and the utility. Okay, and then you've got the, um, the books as well. So, uh, there's the references as well, which you might want to look at. And you've got the books able to collate the collate the collective, the uh, teacher books, that kind of thing. Now, plotted principles. These are my principles, which I've now I've looked at. I've looked at all of the different principles in all the different books and tried to come up with some kind of umbrella term that will convey what they are, what they mean. Okay. Um, and here they are. So, stability. Scalability, simplicity, situational awareness is one that you won't actually find in very many places, but it's very useful in HCI, especially when it comes to um, uh, interactions with complex safety critical systems like our flight nets, flight controls. Um, Self description, progressive disclosure, uh, familiarity, availability, consistency. And here I've noticed I've put robustness. So I think robustness is a principle of um, these kind of usability experiences as opposed to necessarily to accessibility points. So how do we remember this? Sad fucker. It's how we remember this. So make sure you, uh, you can uh, remember this. You know what? Um, that's the way that I remember it anyway. Uh, so, uh, you know, just look at the Okay. Now these positive principles are the principles I want you to look at. There's ways of actually uh, ensuring that you have stability, you have stability, you have simplicity, or things you can think about. And those are in the next sort of slides after this coffee break. Okay. It's been a whirlwind tour this morning. I'm sorry about that, but we want to get obviously you'd be more interested in thought works than you are in it. Because uh, uh, they uh, have a more interesting uh, kind of uh, presentation. Okay. You're looking confused. What's going on? Oh, I'm going to throw it. I'm going to throw it. Okay, so when we, got, when we got to this point, has anybody got any questions before we have this 10 minute break and then you're going to come back to the floor where it's uh, out to the Anyone got any questions on this? I'm going to leave for a second because I need to get the floor where it's so.